It is a pleasure to join you tonight, and I'm looking forward to speaking with you about techniques in space-time physics for clean energy production. And essentially what we're looking at is taking energy from curved space-time naturally occurring around the Earth. This may very well be the next generation of energy that will come from the harvesting of the flow of space-time motive force across curved space-time. It's abundant in supply, naturally occurring and clean. It's highly efficient because we go direct to the source. There's no hazardous byproducts and minimal impact to the planet, even though I'd emphasize that more study is needed to understand the effect on our global ecosystem. But for those who are not familiar with the term space-time mode of force or uh, curved space-time, let's show it quickly in this uh, a short description in this example. You can see the Earth. Anytime matter appears in the fabric of space-time, we know it distorts uh, space-time around that mass. But also, as Einstein's special theory of relativity predicted, and we proved uh, almost 25 years ago, is that as the a rotating body spins, it actually twists space-time around it, like a spring. And that effect of twisting of space-time is called, in physics, inertial frame dragging. The potential energy stored in curved space-time around the rotating Earth, or any moon or any planet, is like a spring. And if that rotating body like the Earth were to be removed, that spring would snap back. The difference is, is that the potential energy that is stored in curved space-time is absolutely enormous. Now how much is this inertial frame dragging? How much does space-time twist around a, a rotating body? Well the answer is very very small. If you take a look at this page, this slide, it shows a mathematical derivation of frame dragging uh, which holds accurate today. Frame dragging is very very small, measured in the fractions of arc seconds, very small fractions. Uh, however, when combined with the uh, kinetic energy of the Earth, the overall effect can be quite significant, measurable, and meaningful. As a matter of fact, the kinetic energy of our rotating planet is very, very large. Um, if we take a look at the formula on the left for kinetic energy, uh, considering the angular speed and moment of inertia, and we calculate it on the right, what we see is the period of the Earth being roughly about 23.93 hours with an angular velocity of 7.29 times 10 to the minus fifth radians per second gives us a moment of inertia of about 8.04 times 10 to the 37th kilogram meters squared. That's roughly about 2.14 times 10 to the 29th joules. This is a massive amount of energy, and I'll try to put that in perspective, but first the question arrives, is it safe to harvest? As a scientist, I know, and we all know, that nothing is free, and that our planet is a complex system, and everything is connected to each other, and everything is interdependent on each other. We also know in physics and science of laws like the conservation of energy, which demands that there must be effect. If you take energy from one source, it must have a ripple effect across other parts of this environment. And of course things will happen. If we harvest space-time mode of force some of the impacts, global tides would change, the Earth's rotation would slow, the orbit of moon, orbit of the moon would increase, the weather patterns of the Earth could be altered. Would it be global chaos in the end of the world? Absolutely not, or at least that's what most experts agree. And let's put that in terms of an example. Let's say if right now, over the next 1,000 years, we agreed to gradually slow the Earth's rotation by seven ten thousandths of a second. I'd encourage you right now to try to count what is exactly seven ten thousandths of a second. Now imagine that short amount, that moment of time, we're going to slowly slow down the Earth so the day is seven ten thousandths of a second, second slower, not today or tomorrow, but over 1,000 years. The day would become 86,164.09 seconds, which many people would agree would be almost an unnoticeable effect with no consequences. We're assuming, by the way, for arguments to keep this example simple, is that the space-time coupling coefficient is at a one. So what does this mean? is that the Earth will give up by slowing down seven times seven ten thousandths of a second, 3.6 times 10 to the 21st power joules. Converting that to watts, we get one times 10 to the 15th kilowatt, kilowatts hours. Now, for those of you who realize that uh, Americans are, are very, very energy hungry and we consume a lot, and secondly, because 
uh, the data was more readily accessible for me today as I recorded this presentation, uh, I'd like to put this in perspective for you. This amount of power created by slowing down the Earth seven ten thousandths of a second is identical to the total electric use of all Americans for 1,000 years as calculated above. In a different perspective, it's the same as if you had a large 50 megawatt electric power generating plant operating continually for 2 to the 108th power hours. That's roughly 23,000 years. That's an amazing amount of energy harvest just by a simple slowing down of the rotation of the Earth. And that tells you a little bit about the spinning energy of the Earth, which is roughly, to put that in perspective, 60,000 million times the total electric usage of Americans for the year. So this is certainly a solution. Uh, harvesting space-time motive force stored in the naturally occurring curved space-time around our planet could be a possible solution for the future. And the tools that we use to do that would be a time warp field generator, or what's called today a time reactor. A time warp field generators were originally designed to generate containable and controllable fields of closed time-like curves for use in physics research. Uh, they were actually, the uh, concept of time warp field theories was discovered doing high-speed space-based navigation models uh, where a new relationship between space, time, and energy surfaced, uh, and it made us realize that it's possible to harness this at relatively lower power levels than previously thought. It wasn't until the third generation of time warp field generator that we realized that it actually had the potential to harvest energy. So essentially, a time reactor is a time warp field generator that has been optimized for harvesting energy. And essentially all you need is shown in the lower left is a region where space-time is curved due to the effect of inertial frame dragging or any other naturally occurring or man-made phenomenon and a time reactor operating in some configuration within that region of space and time. So essentially a time reactor is a system that accesses and applies that stored potential energy within the regions of curved space-time or hyperspace. Now this could look in many different ways. On the left hand side of the slide you'll see configurations where the emitter and collector are in two different locations. One transmitting energy from the surface of the Earth uh, to uh, a platform in orbit. The other transforming energy from a platform in orbit to the surface of the Earth. On the top center you'll see an Earth Earth-based emitter and collector array, and on the right another configuration where perhaps um, time reactor configurations can be used to harvest energy for space uh, travel where ships can stop and refuel at any rotating mass, moon, or planet in space to recharge your systems and generate energy. It's also important to point out that a time reactor doesn't necessarily have to be on a large scale uh, which it can be as shown in the lower right, it is also theoretically possible, even if not technically today, to build time reactors on a micro scale for energy production. So a single time reactor may include some parts and components either in a single point or at two or more points within a region of curved space time or hyperspace. How does it work? Well, essentially, a time reactor simply discharges and captures the potential energy stored within curved space-time or hyperspace. First, you must be in a region with the right characteristics. This is very important. Then you must have a reactor emitter and collector, two key components of the system, which I'll show later. And they must be aligned either with each other or at a point of intersection that could be located uh, at either one of their locations or at a point distance across that region of curved space-time. Then an emitter field is charged and a beam is initiated. This is done using a chemical reagent, a high power laser array, and a high amount of initial energy. And then we introduce a very key part of this using a proprietary injector system design, a rotating field. This combines the fields created in the previous step with this one. And this combination of fields actually helps facilitate the propagation of that space-time motive force. And also when the discharge is formed and begins, it helps contain and capture that space-time motive force. So when the space-time motive force discharge occurs, we simply capture that energy. And as a reminder, it does crea again create a concentrated fields of closed time-like curves for those of you who are interested in that subject, which is separate from this presentation. 
The key components of a time reactor may vary both in their design and how they're assembled. These are covered by several patents uh, that have been sequestered as well as some that were publicly filed last year by the Anderson Institute. The key components of time reactors uh, generally includes, of course, the environment where it much must operate, uh, a reactor emitter and collector, an energy storage device, power conduits, a control system, and a reactor field chamber. That's where we actually capture and modulate fields of closed time-like curves. Now, of course, I've shown you some very simple examples, and there are complex variances and efficiency considerations uh, that need to be considered. Some of those more complex considerations include the fact that the Earth is not solid, that the density and the viscosity varies as we move into the Earth's core. Uh, so the space-time coupling coefficient may not be a 1. Also, the support technologies in the time reactor are lossy, and the regional characteristics in the area where it's operating may vary. We, of course, need more impact analysis, and we have to understand the effect that time reactor designs can have on our planetary system and society. But it's, it's clear to see that the orders of magnitudes of improvement, both in output performance and risk and hazard reduction, uh, are significant. So how do we all become a part of the solution? For Mr. George Roeder, the CEO of Engineers Without Border, as he said, change starts with you. Not only the small changes that you can affect in your life, in your homes, in your schools, in your businesses, in your families, uh, but also in the world. And as you look to affect change for the better good of human society, always remember his key message that intentions are not enough. It's nice to have good intentions, but sometimes the best intentions can backfire on you. You need to challenge yourself and debate and study and understand the details to make sure that the intentions and the actions that you're taking are producing the results that you're looking for. Dr. Edgar Mitchell inspired us with a lot of words, including to f encourage you to follow your dreams and to have faith in yourself, and most importantly, to have hope, no matter how overwhelming the task may seem at hand, to have hope and to look for it, and if you do, you'll find it. And for you physicists, I'd like to emphasize that the first step forward to understanding new opportunities in space-time physics, those opportunities that can help ourselves and human society, that first step is the most difficult. And that first step, as we said it before, is that we do not see our universe the way it is. We see the universe the way we are. Our senses are limited. We perceive a small microscopic part of this universe around us, as well as the opportunities. We have to overcome those limitations of our senses and the limitations of the way our mind's belief system operates. And when we do that, uh, we can better visualize uh, the true makeup and nature of space-time in our universe and how to better put it to use for the betterment of human society and this planet. Thank you again for all your consideration and I look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Goodbye for now.